Uh, thanks a lot for uh, getting up early, coming to hear me talk. Um, it's an honor to be um, included in the, in the, in the uh, conference this year. This is my second time to Casual Connect Am- Amsterdam. Um, and as uh, Jessica very kindly pointed out, and as you can probably tell from all the gray hair, I've been in the game industry for a long time. Um, 2015 is actually my 20th year in the business. Um, which uh, is shocking to me, um, honestly. Um, But along the way, I I started off as a game designer on You Don't Know Jack and have had the opportunity to work with some um, very cool teams at Pogo and at Playfish. Um, I started a small venture fund that um, invested in companies like Super Evil Megacorp and Fun Plus, where I I work now and have for the past year and a half or so. so 20 years is long enough to be able to say that I've uh, actually attended the first ever Casual Connect um, in Seattle. I think it was called the Casual Game Conference back then. But in the about 10 years since, it's been a, um, it's been a wild ride. A lot of changes happened in the industry, a lot of growth. And that's part of what I want to talk about today, what the, what the last 10 years has looked like. Um, but really where I want to focus is um, on the what I think is going to be the most interesting and transformative um, period of time since I've been in the industry, the next three to five years. Um, so just by way of context, I'm going to talk a little bit about Fun Plus and what we do. The company was founded in 2010 by a couple of guys named Andy and Itao. One of them lived in Beijing, the other one lived in San Francisco. And um, that kind of international origin story has really influenced the way that we've grown the company and the way that we think about the business. Um, We've got over 400 employees now, um, and they come from all over the world. Um, We've got offices in Beijing, San Francisco, Vancouver, Singapore, and Bangkok. Um, What do we do? Well, first and foremost, we make games. um, But really what we're focused on over the course of this year and next year is building not just uh, commercially successful games, but we really want to focus on building games that are well-crafted and respected within the industry. The reason is that we think that well-crafted games not only have the best chance of success, but they also um, gain you credibility in the industry and attract the right kind of people to you as potentially employees, but but also as partners. And we think that that broad partnership um, group is really what lays the foundation for a long-lived business. Uh, Secondarily, those games are going to bring people into our community. And the way that we engage people once they're in that community through the operations of our games is really what will allow us to curate additional games for them in the future. Um, And then uh, finally, we want to focus on customer service. This is an area that we feel like is a little underdeveloped in in the video game industry right now, but it's the foundation to a lot of really great service businesses that that we admire. Um, So what exactly um, do I mean when I say the gaming world is flat? So in in August, Dean Takahashi um, from VentureBeat um, wrote an article um, where he talked about all the travel he did in 2014 um, and how struck he was by how global the industry has become. Um, He compared the anecdotes that he had kind of collected along the way to the stories that a guy named Thomas Friedman included in his book, The World is Flat. Um, If you haven't read The World is Flat, it's about globalization in the 21st century and the forces that are flattening the global economy um, that allow um, people and countries to participate in the economy in ways that they hadn't previously. Because we had had some kind of news stories in 2014, I I got the chance to talk to Dean a couple of times, and this topic came up every time we talked. It's something we think about a lot at Fun Plus, and so kind of inspired by Dean, I decided to use The World is Flat as a framework for really looking at the industry, both where we've been and where we're going. So what I'm going to talk about is um, the round game world, and I picked uh, 2014 as kind of uh, the, the year to cover. Um, 2014 is a nice round number, 10 years ago. It was kind of the beginning of the casual game conference in Seattle, I think. And, um, and it was also a year that I think of as the last year where really we were, um, these, these forces weren't influencing the industry substantially. And then I'm going to talk about the flattening forces. 
Um, next, uh, I'll talk about the industry today and how it has changed as a result of these trends that, um, that I'm going to identify. And then finally, I'm going to make some probably haphazard predictions about where I think the industry is going to be in 2020. Um, hopefully, they, they, they will be um, relatively logical, but I invite all of you to look me up in 2020 if I'm wrong and chastise me and, and heap shame upon me. Um, so, 2004. Um, looking around the room, it looks like most of you were probably in middle school in 2004, so I'm just going to set some context. Um, World of Warcraft launched in, in 2004. Um, which is kind of amazing to think about. Um, it feels like it's, it's a business that's been around forever. It's been incredibly influential throughout the game industry, creatively and as a business. Um, another incredibly influential business that launched in 2004 was Facebook. Um, it's hard to imagine a world without Facebook. It's hard to imagine a game industry without Facebook, but it, it launched uh, just 10 years ago. Um, and uh, this guy was re-elected in 2004. And when I say this guy, I mean the... Uh, the guy on the left. Um, so when I look at these three things, um, it's kind of funny. I, I feel like I wasted more time on these three things in 2004 and the years since than probably anything else in the world. Um, so the game industry in 2004, it was a $26 billion industry globally. Um, and it was Western dominated and PC and console dominated. Um, that's not to say there weren't strong regional game industries in places like South, uh, South Korea, especially in China. But in terms of contribution to global revenue, it was really about the Western kind of traditional distribution-based publishers like EA and Activision and the console manufacturers, Sony, Nintendo. And if you drill down and look at what the mobile game industry looked like in 2004, it was a very different picture than what we have today. Um, a little company called Jamdat was founded in 2004. I don't know if anybody out there is old enough to remember Jamdat, but it was eventually sold to EA and I think 2009 and became the basis for EA Mobile. Um, the, the, world video ga the world mobile game market in 2004 was only $120 million. That was less than one half of 1% of the total video game market at that time. And here, um, I've put together a matrix to kind of give you a sense of what the market looked like globally. Um, I've called out five key regions and the top games in those regions, the companies responsible for those games, the platforms on which the games um, appeared, the distribution model for those games, and the business model for those games. And if I were to kind of summarize this matrix, it's pretty fragmented. Different top game in every one of these territories and a different company responsible for each of those top games. If you look at these companies, they're largely regionally or nationally focused companies. Um, what's especially interesting to me is, um, one, the, the, the business models. Um, obviously in the West plus Japan, it was a packaged goods vis business model primarily. Um, but the distribution model um, when I kind of was putting this deck together and thinking about what that looked like, it, it almost seemed comical how manual the distribution of games was back then. Take uh, the Western packaged goods business. If you wanted to get games in front of customers, you had to throw some crazy conference called E3, big parties, invite celebrities and all of this stuff. It was a really cool thing, except consumers weren't allowed in at all. This conference was entirely about convincing retail buyers from some chain of game stores in, you know, Idaho that the game that you were going to launch was going to be amazing. If they bought it and they agreed to commit shelf space to you, you then went out and manufactured millions of discs, put them into boxes, put those onto trucks, got them into a warehouse and onto store shelves. Um, hopefully, if your TV ads were compelling enough, you'd be able to convince some customer to pop down 50 bucks before they'd ever even played the game. Um, in, the, in the East, it wasn't all that much different, actually. While these were free-to-play games, most of them were pay played in internet cafes. And if you wanted to distribute your game, you'd have to manufacture the discs, hire a team of people to go out and talk to the owners or managers of all these mom-and-pop internet cafes all over the country, convince them to pre-install the games onto PCs, and then market the games within the internet cafe. It's just entirely different than what we think about as game distribution today. 
Um, 2004 was also interesting because it was really just the beginning of when Tencent's QQ messaging platform had started to distribute games directly. So what are the forces that are actually flattening the industry? Um, give me a second, I'm going to take a quick drink break. So um, Friedman in his book talks about um, a number of different forces that have kind of flattened the global economy. Uh, most of them are technological forces. Um, in the first edition of the book, there were about 10 of them. There were things like Netscape and uploading. Um, when you read it now, it all feels a little bit old-timey, honestly. Um, I'm, I'm going to talk about just three forces that I think are particularly relevant to the game industry. Um, but before I do that, I want to take a moment to appreciate um, Mr. Friedman's mustache. Um, if we can all do that, I think it's kind of a, I think it's kind of a notable mustache. Um, okay, so I think that obviously the biggest thing that has really impacted the distribution of games is um, internet penetration globally. Um, internet penetration has removed essentially all of the friction to distributing games to customers. Um, in the developed world, um, there was pretty good in internet penetration in 2004. 54% of the, of the developed world had access to the internet. In 2014, it's 58%. So it's grown, but it hasn't grown um, radically. What, what's really been impactful is that in the developing world, um, internet penetration has grown pretty, pretty remarkably. Um, in 2004, just 7% of the population was uh, connected to the internet, whereas now it's about 22%. Um, the chart on the right shows what's kind of sometimes thought of as the digital divide, and you can see how it's, how it's converged over the last five or six years. Um, if you take a look at India specifically, which is, I think, a really interesting market to watch, um, just 0.6% of the population had access to a PC in 2004, whereas today, um, well, in 2014, 13% um, of the population has um, access to a PC. And, and when you apply that 13% to a country the size of India, it's really a remarkable market that's, that's opened up. Um, so the second thing that I think is really impacting the game industry as a flattener is um, that internet users are now basically smartphone users. On the right, you see a chart that came from the Mary Meeker report that Kleiner Perkins puts out every year. And what this shows is um, the percentage of internet traffic in total that is coming from mobile devices. The green columns are 2013 and the blue columns are 2014. Um, as you can see, globally, it's shifting to mobile really, really quickly. Um, but it's especially interesting to look at territories like Africa, um, where as people get online for the first time, they're increasingly doing that on a, on a smartphone. So as you'd expect, smartphone penetration is increasing incredibly rapidly. In 2013, smartphone and tablet penetration um, was, or smartphone and tablet shipments were four times that of PCs, and that gap is uh, accelerating. Um, India, for example, has, in, in 2013, had 10% smartphone penetration. And if you kind of compare that to the 13% PC penetration that I just talked about, if it hasn't happened already, more people are connecting to the internet via smartphones in India than, than, than by PCs. Um, in China, an incredible 80% of internet users are mobile users. Um, and again, China's a pretty big market, so that's a, a, a fairly staggering statistic. Um, and one of the things that I found really, really interesting about the, the Mary Meeker report is um, the shift of screen minutes to mobile. They surveyed um, people in the 30 most populous countries in the world. And in 25 of those countries, people are spending more time looking at a smartphone than they are a PC or a TV. Um, that means more than 65% of the population of the world spends more time looking at their phone than any other screen. Um, and so when you think about what territories you want to focus on as you grow your business and expand into some of these emerging markets, um, this list is a pretty good list. If, uh, if you'll indulge me, I'll go through the list as quickly as I possibly can. Indonesia, the Philippines, China, Brazil, Vietnam, the US, Nigeria, Colombia, Thailand, Saudi Arabia, Russia, Argentina, the UK, Kenya, Australia, Spain, Turkey, Mexico, 
India, Poland, South Korea, Germany, Canada, Japan, and Italy. In all of those countries, people spend more time looking at their phone than any other screen. And uh, the last thing that I think has really been impactful um, on the game industry is Apple and Google. They've really created uh, a world in which internet accessible devices are Google or Apple uh, driven. Um, iOS and Android have an amazing 95% or more uh, mobile operating system share globally. And the chart on the right kind of charts that over time. What you basically are seeing is that Android and iOS are the only operating systems available for smartphones of, of any kind of relevance from a market size perspective. Um, and, and what that growth has enabled is pretty incredible. I'm sure by now you've all heard a little bit about Apple's Q4 earnings um, and how amazing they were. Um, in case you've been hanging out in the coffee shops for the past couple of weeks here in Amsterdam, um, Apple announced that in Q4 of 2014, they made $200 million in profit a day. Um, Apple's revenue is now larger than the GDP of Israel. Um, if we have any uh, Israeli folks here, um, sorry, I'm sure your falafels are still much better than Apple's. Um, and if you look at the growth that's, cap that, that's possible on those platforms, um, it's also pretty amazing. Um, looking at iOS in particular in Q3 of 2014, China revenue was up 161% in one quarter. Uh, Panamia was up 55%. Pan-Asia up 20, uh, sorry, 35%. And uh, the U.S. was up 20, 29%. That's just in a single quarter. Another thing that was really interesting about the third quarter of 2014 is that um, you have some interesting players that, that, that um, showed up on the top grossing list for the first time. Um, Mixi, a Japanese company. Line, a kind of a Japanese South Korean company. And Tencent, a Chinese company. So what does that mean for where we are today? Um, and again, just to provide a little bit of context on what happened in 2014, World of Warcraft launched again. This time it was Drainer. I don't know if you guys are, are playing that, but it's still kicking. Um, Facebook bought Oculus. Um, it's, a, it's kind of an amazing testament to how, how large Facebook has grown over the last 10 years. Um, and this guy got some water thrown on him. Um, as an aside, I spent a little bit of time looking on Google for what George Bush did in 2014, and it was surprisingly difficult to find anything, which I actually felt like was kind of nice. Um, so the, so the global game market in 2014, and thanks to the local guys from guys and gals from Nuzu who, who, who put a great study together, um, it's about $80 billion a year right now. Mobile games um, are 20% of that total market, or about $17 billion. Um, that's up ch from just one half of 1% 10 years ago. Um, as Nick pointed out, uh, mobile game revenue is going to eclipse console revenue for the first time this year. And I think that's a really interesting tipping point for um, kind of the center of gravity of the video game industry globally. Um, most sources are forecasting that, that mobile revenue is going to double in the next two to three years, while all of the other game platforms are flat to declining, essentially. So if you look at the, the worldwide matrix that I, that I put together for 2004 and just compare, it, compare that to mobile in, in 2014, it's much, much less fragmented. Um, fewer games are the top games globally. Um, fewer companies are represented. Um, but what I think is really interesting is that there's one distribution model and one business model. Um, free to play, which was really just being innovated in South Korea and China in in 2004 is now really the only relevant business model for mobile games um, everywhere in the world. And um, frictionless distribution, the kind of distribution that's provided by Apple and Google where you know, there's very low kind of economic barrier to entry to get a game in front of customers, um, you might think would lead to additional fragmentation, but it actually seems um, that the opposite is the case. Um, and that we're seeing a less fragmented global marketplace. So what does that mean for the future? This is where I could be wrong. Um, uh, so I think that what we're going to see is in 2020, a more than $50 billion mobile game industry worldwide. 
Um, and that's within the context of a video game industry that, is, that, that growth has essentially slowed or stopped. Um, mobile will eat the video game industry almost entirely. Um, a couple of things are going to drive the growth of mobile. One, um, you know, the, the current kind of roughly 20% CAGR will continue through this period, in my opinion. Um, but the PC and console space will start to shrink. That will mean not only that revenue is shifted from PC and console to mobile, but I think more, more importantly for all of us, development dollars and talent will shift into mobile. I think the games that, that come out of that landscape are going to monetize customers more efficiently and retain customers for longer. Um, emerging market growth is really going to drive um, drive the industry forward over the next few years as well. I think in the next two to three years, the emerging markets like India are going to become a key battleground state for um, regionally dominant game companies that are, fi that are looking to find growth go globally. But by 2020, that battle will be over and we'll see the emergence of globally dominant video game companies. Um, India will hit 50% smartphone penetration by 2020. Um, what I think that will mean for developers is that India in particular will be, for developers, the most lucrative market in the world. Um, I also think that we're going to see the rise of a third, OS, uh, third mobile OS from China. Um, the government is actually subsidizing or funding a, um, uh, a project to build a mobile operating system that is not um, Android based for some obvious reasons. Um, and I don't expect that that iOS will take off, but companies like Xiaomi are um, purportedly working on um, a mobile iOS that is not Android based as well. And I think uh, the Chinese government support of that plus the traction that companies like Xiaomi are getting in emerging markets like India um, could well mean that we see in 2020 a third Chinese OS that has 15% global market share worldwide. So. Um, Games, what are games going to look like in 2020? This is a fun part. I have to have some water for it. Um, so I think that in 2020, the winners are going to take all. I, I think that, that that's been said by a number of people over the past couple of years as, as the mobile market has matured. Um, I, I, I do think it's true, but I think my opinion is maybe a little bit different than, than what you um, hear from other folks. I think that regional top grossing lists are essentially going to unify worldwide. What I mean is that the same five to ten games will be in the top grossing list everywhere in the world. Um, the implication there is that the notion of regional taste in games will disappear. Um, it's conventional wisdom right now that culturalization is required for Western games going East or Eastern games coming West. Um, I just don't think that will be the case in 2020. Um, those ideas are a reflection of what's worked in the past but I don't think they're a predictor of what's going to work in the future. Remember that these regional game industries were very fragmented and there wasn't much interplay between the various companies and the various games globally. Um, since that friction has been removed thanks to the app stores and internet penetration, game makers and game players have access to more games from all over the world now. What that means is tastes are going to change. They're going to be influenced by those games, both Western and Eastern. And we'll see games that are kind of a hybrid of Eastern and Western games. They do the best of what game makers in both regions do, and those games will become globally dominant. Clash of Clans, I think, is a really great example of a, of, of, of a game that's kind of been successful in spite of the fact that it hasn't been uh, culturized. Um, if you hear people talk about what's necessary to make a game successful in China, you frequently hear them talk about the art style, not referencing Western folklore, both of which kind of Clash of Clans does. They also say that, you know, the notion of Western um, easy onboarding and bringing people into PvP experiences through, through PvE experiences um, is, is not what's done in China. That's exactly what Clash of Clans does. And, and when, it, when it launched in China, it was immediately successful. I think it's about market access. It's not about exactly how you design your game. The same is true for, for uh, games that are much more Eastern, like Brave Frontier, that are doing really well in the West right now. 
I also think you're going to see the first game that makes 20 million dollars a day by 2020. Um, that's a big number, um, but I think it's absolutely possible. Um, if you imagine a, a 50 billion dollar a year mobile game industry and the share of revenue that's currently owned within the app stores by the top 10 games, it's pretty logical to imagine that you'd see a 7 billion dollar game annually. Um, I also think that free-to-play games, service games, will, will um, account for 98% or more of the global game revenue. Um, the, the notion of premium priced games um, is, I think, largely an artifact of the retail business in the West and most of the world never had that retail business. India never had that retail business, China never had that retail business. And so as those, as those territories grow and become the, major, the majority of the video game industry, you'll just see that that business model uh, slowly disappears and all but for some niche products. Um, and I think you're going to see the rise of what is actually a publisher 2.0. Um, over the course of the past few years, you've heard a lot of people talk about trying to build a publisher 2.0. Essentially, what does it mean to build a company like EA or Activision in a world where digital distribution is the norm and um, it's friction-free? I think that these companies are going to be service-based, not distribution-based. Um, and the companies that are able to capture this market, I think, will be $30 billion market cap companies at least. So what do I mean by a service-based uh, publisher? Um, so far, I've talked a lot about the forces that are kind of flattening the game world and um, removing distribution friction and increasing reach for game makers. I haven't really talked about any of the friction that this much larger addressable audience um, creates for game makers. Um, at a really high level, the world is flat is about kind of outsourcing and what that means for workers in places like America. Um, one of the things that Friedman talks about in the book is um, that certain service businesses are just not outsourceable. Um, service is inherently local. Um, and I think that's true in the video game business. So publishing 1.0 was built about, was, was really based on distribution. Um, I've talked a lot about the friction in retail distribution and how difficult it is to get a game onto a disc, into a box, and onto a shelf. Um, solving that problem is an expensive and very specialized problem, but once you solve it, that's a very defensible business. It's, it's what made EA EA. EA is not EA, in my opinion, because their ability to pick hits or finance games. It's about the fact that they solved distribution early and it was very difficult for other companies to come in and steal that business from them. Um, but the app stores don't work like retail. Um, they have unlimited shelf space and unlimited foot traffic. Uh, what that means for the retailer is that there's no sell-in risk. They can take in as much product as, as they want with, with, with no risk. Um, you know, there's no switching cost for customers either or for the retailers. So in, it, rather than in a world where you commit shelf space to a certain game and if that game doesn't work, you're kind of, you're squandering a very limited resource. If, if one of the uh, platforms, Apple or Google, features your game and the game doesn't work, they can change that in an hour if they wanted to. Um, there's just no risk to them. So, um, what I'm essentially saying is that I don't think distribution reach is a defensible thing to build your business on right now. Um, at least not the way that it's being contemplated by most folks. Um, Eric Seufert, and I apologize if he's here and I'm mispronouncing his last name, but he's a really, really um, smart guy who, who writes extensively about mobile distribution and, and free to play. Um, he recently gave a talk um, where he said that 2015 was the year that um, you would see the large mobile game players start to spend defensively on user acquisition. Essentially, they'll drive up the bid prices for installs so high that it'll box out competitors. Um, that certainly is happening right now, but I don't think that that actually solves anything for those companies. Um, what it does is erode your margins in a very unsustainable way and it doesn't actually prevent a game like Trivia Crack which completely circumvents the traditional performance-based user acquisition model um, from growing into a really large business with a lot of reach, a lot of revenue almost overnight. 
Um, that's because this, all of this spend is really customer acquisition and performance acquisition based. Um, what, what I think is much more interesting is investing that same money into service operations, which are essentially retention based marketing. Um, services need to be local in the video game world in the same way that Friedman talked about. Um, every customer touch point needs to be local. When you're operating in any territory, you need to invest in local advertising, both local ad networks and offline advertising, bus boards and things like that. That needs to be done locally. Um, local events, both in-game and out-of-game. Um, it's kind of free-to-play 101, but if you run a 4th of July event in your, in your game in Thailand, it's not only not as effective, it kind of tells the players in that territory that this game isn't for them. You need to be running events and content in your game that is locally relevant, and you need to be running offline events that, that really co-op the enthusiasm of your players. The picture on the right is an event that we, that we ran for a game that we operate in Thailand called Dot Arena that was kind of a tournament and fan fest thing in the same way that BlizzCon is a fan fest. We believe that building brand that way and co-opting your players' enthusiasm is ultimately about retention marketing. And that needs to be done locally. And then finally, CS and CM. These things need to be done locally. It's not about just having customer service agents who speak the right language. It's about having community managers who are aware of what's relevant in any local territory and make the, make the experience feel like it's customized specifically for your players in every territory. But doing all of that when you have a global business is incredibly difficult. You need to have a highly specialized organization. You need to have the capital to build out offices in all of these territories. And it's a logistics heavy business. In the same way that retail distribution was capital intensive and logistics heavy. Um, that's what we think is going to be the foundation of this second generation of publishers that will ultimately become the biggest game companies in 2020. So in summary, um, I wanted to just talk about um, customer service. Um, Tony Shea, of, that's the guy up there, he, he's the CEO of Zappos. Um, and he's pretty inspiring when he talks about customer service, at least in my opinion. Zappos built an amazing business by doing the least interesting thing in the world. They sell shoes on the internet. I, I, it's a stretch for me to figure out something more boring than selling shoes on the internet. Um, they didn't differentiate on technology, they didn't differentiate on the products they sell, or the price of those products. It was 100% about the service experience they gave to their customers. Um, I think that game makers do the most interesting thing in the world. We make games. Games are the most important pop art of this century, without a doubt. They're, they're the cultural reference point for anybody under 30. If we actually service our customers in a way that's nearly as good as Zappos do, does, I think that we're going to create incredible relationships with our customers and we're going to build our brands in a way that will absolutely obviate the notion of things like defensive acquisition spend. We'll actually build meaningful long-lived businesses like Disney. Um, that's, what, that's what we're focused on and that's what um, I would argue we all should be focused on in the next three to five years. So. Um, that's it for me. Thanks very much. Um, we're hiring, publishing, and investing. And I want to thank really quickly all the sources that I used in here. Newzoo, Magid, Mary Meeker, IDC, IDATE, App Annie, International Telecommunications Union, Chin and Ferry, uh, Friedman, and Dean Takahashi. Thanks. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Dan. Um, don't go anywhere. We're in for a real treat next. Uh, Emily's going to come up and set up, but while she's setting up, we've probably time for one quick question. If anybody has a quick question for Dan. Well, if nobody has a question, then I'm going to ask. Um, okay. So over in the West, we have it sort of uh, pretty easy with uh, the App Store and the and uh, there are only a small number of places. Where in Asia, it's very fragmented with thousands of App Stores. Is that going to change? Is it going to be consolidation? Or is that just going to be the way of the future? Yeah, so uh, um, I... My opinion on this, and, and I think the one corollary I'd probably um, make to all of the postulations that I, that I talked about here, um, is China. Um, I think that it is largely an Apple and Google world, and those app stores will dominate everywhere in the world, with the possible exception of China. And I think that largely has to do with how the Chinese government's relationship with Google goes. Um, 
the business model in China is upside down for developers. Um, most of the world is kind of a 70% 70, 70 developer um, revenue share market, and China is kind of a, an effective 20 to 30% um, revenue share market. Um, I think if the government starts to um, reduce the friction to foreign companies competing in that market, we'll see it normalize to what we see in the rest of the world, but that's a, that's a big question. But short answer is, everywhere in the world except China, I think, is going to be roughly Apple and Google. Okay, well, thank you very much. Awesome job. Thanks.